signed with a team and we went off to Bahrain to uh, to see what we could do and ended up qualifying on pole. Who else is in this race? Um, in this race was like Nico Hulkenberg, uh, Sebastian Buemi. Holy shit. Um I knew he'd yes. be able to name off the prominent some prominent names. I mean, I mean yeah. I mean, this I'd, love, I'd love to see the entry list again. Every actually, time, yeah. every time we have uh, Andy Carr, or open wheel guy, in here, and he's talking about this particular sort of point in his career, um, and they're like, "Yeah, I was in, I was in Europe. I was 16 years old, and I was racing against." And he'll they'll just yep. have names on yeah. these on these entry lists and the people that you were competing against. For I think sure. it just drives home the point of, For sure. of how good you were. Yeah, so we qualified pole, um, and again, like one people, what a lot of people don't realize is when you go over to Europe. At the time, like Europeans almost looked down at North American mm -hmm. motorsport that it wasn't as competitive. Mm. So when we got there, I think there was six people from the U.S. Championship that went over to the race, and you could tell we were just kind of like discredited at the beginning. So the fact that we threw it on pole, like it kind of opened everyone's eyes. But then in tech after qualifying my car got disqualified oh no mm. because of uh there was like a cover for the suspension that had to be fitted and, and mine wasn't okay so it's like a non-performance part but rules are rules i'm gone like this series was so strict that if like the bmw logo was not in its allocated measurement box you would be disqualified yeah so like they were sticklers of the rules which i respected but it was a heat format, so I had to start all three qualifying heats now from last, which is like 36th or something, and had to fight through the field in all three qualifying heats. And I finished like 6th, 5th, and 3rd in the three heats. And then for the pre-final, now I'm lined up 6th for the pre-final going into like I'm, I'm right back in the game. Like I could still win this thing. And um, I was trying to pass um, Sam Bird. He's a Formula E driver now. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had some contact and I got a puncture. So like all my hard work of the whole week, just like down the drain, had to start the final in like 34th uh, and mm. finish fifth. Wow. Um, and then from that, I didn't get the Formula One test. I wasn't a world champion, but I left with the Red Bull contract in my hand. How did, I mean, they, they come up to you afterwards? And Honestly, after the first heat, um, so qualified pole, I think a lot of people were like, hey, who's this guy? And then um, went from last to sixth in the first heat. And then Dr. Helmut Marco introduced himself to me. I was like, okay. <laughs> Didn't really know who he was, but. Who uh, is he? He's um, the motorsport advisor for Red Bull. Okay. And he's in charge of their development program. So he's got a um, contract in his pocket. And he's looking for somebody to give it to. Apparently. Mm -hmm. um, well, he told me afterwards that they didn't have budget um, because the it was December, so they already had filled the budget for the next season. Um, but then I guess I impressed enough that they fudged some numbers to to, <laughs> they, sque to squeeze me in. They, but they found budget. They found budget, yeah. <laughs> but um, it was just a very surreal experience because I remember that flight home from Bahrain to Toronto. Couldn't even recall the connections that we we probably take twelve connections because it was the only <laughs> flight we could afford. But I remember just like I read the contract like twelve times. And I just couldn't believe what it was because it was basically it was the Red Bull Junior Team contract that was offered to me was like a 10-year agreement, and it mapped out everything you were going to do to Formula One. Wow. wow! Here's your path. And what was it? What like what does that path look like? They the don't context? tell you the year to years, right? But, but it basically, if within the contract, if I raced in Formula One for Red Bull while the contract was active. My salaries were broken down, so I was just like, "Whoa!" Those are numbers, you know. Like sixteen-year-old kid, I'm like, "That's money." Yep, that's a, never seen that many yeah, zeros right. before. Right. Um, and then it was, yeah, it was a fully paid ride as long as I could deliver the results, and it was very high pressure. But you know, the way my childhood went, I kind of had the similar approach to life because if if I didn't win to make it to the next category, my career was over anyway. So when I joined Red Bull. It's a very cut, cutthroat industry, but it, it was do or die. It was either win or you're done. And in the 2006 season, there was 18 drivers in the Red Bull junior team. And uh, when I was finally terminated at the end of 2009, there was four of us left. 
Oh my um, goodness. And yeah, so we uh, made it through. Yeah. So you're in Europe, um, racing and having success. Uh, you know, how do you go over there? You were uh, you won at Silverstone. I mean, how do you go to these tracks and and have success? I mean, you know, I guess I think about Michael Andretti and when he went to F1, struggled to get you know used to the tracks to understand the tracks and be able mm-hmm. to perform. We know Michael was a, was a great racer at the time, uh, but you know, go, going into this unfamiliar, like you say, pressure packed world, you're an American in in a dominated you know area of Europeans. Uh, how did you find the speed? Where did the pace come from? I think I'm a I'm a strong believer that European tracks are way easier to learn than our North American tracks. Okay. How so? European tracks are like perfect <laughs> in every degree. Built, built for racing. Yes. Yeah. With like <laughs> the way the braking markers are done, they're like millimeter perfect, 100 meters, 200 meters, 300 meters, you know, and then every track is the same. So when you go from a Silverstone or to a Nürburgring or to a Monza, the way th- it all works in the performance of the cars and even the quality of the asphalt that they use within the FIA and Formula One, there's like a certain regulation. So from track to track, like the surfaces are very consistent. Hmm. And so as long as you know, if it's like a second gear corner and you know, your sixth gear going, you know, 250 kilometers an hour, you kind of know it's like, I can break at the 100 board and I'm, I'll make it just cause it's all so regulated where yeah. like in America you go to like, mid Ohio and you have like Jim putting out traffic cones <laughs> be- before the start of practice. And you don't know if it's the same as it was yesterday yeah. or, you know. <laughs> or if he's even, yeah, if he's even the same as yesterday, yeah, like, he's like, he oh, got- I have to wait until noon because I'm going off the shadow right. that I use. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's just a lot more raw. Yeah. And that's what I loved about coming back in IndyCar in 2018 was, all the tracks are old school and they have so much character where in Europe, because of the speed of formula one cars, they've had to create like almost unlimited paved runoff situations. So there's never really grass gravel wall anymore in a formula one track. Mm -hmm. It's all like, you know, hundred, 200 feet of paved asphalt on the exit of every corner. So you'd kind of, one, you lose that adrenaline almost becomes like a, video game sensation where it's like, oh, is this corner full throttle? Well, I'm going to try anyway because there's no downside. Right. There's no consequence. Yeah, there's much. no, no right. consequence yeah. for your yeah. air. It's yeah. it's literally like playing eye racing. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, I'll just reset and <laughs> go again, you know, where, you know, a lot of tracks in the IndyCar calendar and NASCAR calendar on road courses, you know, if you drop a wheel, there's problems. pretty uh, healthy price to pay for. Yeah. You know, why, why did you not stay in Europe? What What brought you back? What what ended up happening there? What ultimately brought me back, so once I went over to Europe for with Red Bull, mm-hmm. um, I spent four seasons over there um, racing up until Formula 2. I was told uh, I had to win the championship to move on because there wasn't many steps left, you know, um, and I finished second in the championship, and I was fired. Very close. And I was fired. So how clo- I mean, how close to first? Where, what was... It wasn't, so as close as w- race? wasn't as close no. as I would have liked. Um, unfortunately, we had some, I had a lot of retirements for mechanical issues. Mm. Like I think out of the 16 races, I had seven mechanical retirements. And then I had seven podiums. So like we were competitive when we finished, but didn't finish that often. So even though I did rough, like only completed half the races, we still finished second in the mm-hmm. championship. But they don't seem to care about that, right? Like, they don't it's, factor that in. It's a numbers game, right? Yeah. Like, you have to win to justify. At what point did you drive the DTM cars? So from, I drove a DTM from 2012 to the end of 2017. Is that in that process? Uh, is is because the DTM is a car? Yeah. Right. It's not open wheel. Yeah. And uh, so when I watch now, forgive me now. I'm, <laughs> now, I'm a stock car NASCAR guy, but. <clears throat> When I watch DTM, I'm like, man, that, that they got fenders. It's cool. They bang into each other. Not, in, not they try not to, but um, 
it doesn't seem like it fits in the ladder uh, from your from your go kart beginnings to your F one ask you know your 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 dreams of making it. It doesn't seem like it's part of the process. But you you went you go there and that's yeah. So what ended up happening there was so after I finished at Red Bull, um, I was kind of back scrambling to keep driving to stay yeah. relevant. Um, I found a team that was willing to put me in the GP3 series, which is now Formula 3, mm-hmm. um, for a very good deal. Was able to come up with enough funding to make that deal happen. Uh, finished second in that championship again. I was like, come on, like, just got to win one of these things. Um, and then in 2011, um, finally got a, a proper sponsor. Um, they actually sponsored one of the Formula 1 teams, Marussia Virgin Racing. Mm-hmm. So I was the reserve driver for the Formula 1 team. So on the Formula One weekends, you could be there. I was the full reserve driver in. and just immersed in with the team. Mm-hmm. And then opposite weekends, I'd be racing. And like drivers like myself, Daniel Ricciardo, Jean-Eric Verne, Brendan Hartley, Alexander Rossi, Jules Bianchi, you know, Pietro Fittipaldi, like the list goes on and on and on of drivers that did a similar path. Um, ironically, most of them raced the same year that, that we were racing in 2011, but um, I won the championship there, did my Formula One tests, and... First I, time behind the wheel of an F1 car? Uh, on a racetrack, yeah. I'd done loads of, like, straight-line aero tests, or when I was with Red Bull, we did a lot of, like, demo show runs where you take an F1 car on the street and just do donuts yeah. and stuff. Like, <laughs> gotcha. Tough life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, and after my, my, you know, call them my tryouts, right, like my... F1 young driver tests. I was like, well, I did everything I can now. We just need to see what lands. And I had a contract with the Formula One team. Um, and then I basically just got bought out of it. Um, Who was the contract with? With Marussia Virgin Racing. And um, somebody came in with more money, sponsor money, or bought the contract? Um, someone just came in with sponsor money and basically just outbid me for the seat. Wow. Um, so even though I had some a money. signed contract on my side it uh it wasn't enough and subsequently i did a good enough job in my young driver test that Toto wolf and norbert hogg from mercedes-benz were there um and they asked me if i'd be interested in testing their dtm race car back to square one you know i just wanted to be a professional driver at yeah. the end of the day like obviously i was pursuing a dream of formula one but at some point i just wanted to make a good living doing what I love to do. And uh, so can't say no. I did the test in Barcelona with uh, Mercedes. Test went really well. And then they offered me a, a five-year contract to represent Mercedes-Benz on in DTM. And it was, uh, yeah, I remember signing that contract. It was a, it was a great day because I finally, those zeros that I saw in that Red Bull agreement when I was 16. Fin- finally there. Wasn't as many zeros. <laughs> there one less zero, but it... Uh, you know, it uh, still felt amazing, and that's how I segued to that category. So at this time, also uh, working with this program was Michael Schumacher, mm-hmm. and I'm a huge uh, fan of Michael Schumacher's. Thought that he was sort of the the perfect race car driver. Um, you can share your opinion, uh, but what was it like to be able to just even interact with that guy? It was, yeah, I remember. So once I joined, I think I was 22, 23 when I joined Mercedes, um, Michael had just come out of retirement right. and signed for Mercedes in Formula One. And back in the 90s, M- Michael was a part of the Mercedes junior team. So they thought, like, what better way to re-spark the Mercedes junior team was have Michael as the mentor of the three kids for Mercedes. And... Um, I remember like they told us that it was going to happen. I was like, yeah, it's probably just a marketing thing, you know, like, sure. Yeah. I'm a part of the junior team. And then, um, I was back in Canada during the off season and I wake up to like my phone ringing at 3 AM or whatever. And it's a foreign, like a Swiss number or whatever it was. And I answer and he goes like, nah, it's Michael Schumacher. (laughs) I was just like, what? (laughs) <laughs> he's like he's like where are you i'm like oh, i'm in canada he's like oh sorry did i wake you 
I was like, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> and then we spoke later that day, but it was uh, something I'll remember forever. It was a bit. Yeah. And then he was, he wasn't super involved, but he definitely, he watched, you know, yeah. like I remember my first win in DTM. One of my first messages on my phone is from him congratulating me. Um, it was just like his presence was so powerful that he didn't really have to say that much. Mm -hmm. And you really just kind of, you wanted to perform for him. Because you knew he was watching. Yeah. You knew he was paying attention. Yeah. If you like that conversation, you need to listen to the entire Dale Jr. Download. The podcast is available on all major podcast platforms.